Good morning or afternoon. Uh, so this is the end of week one, and uh, we tried this morning to have a question and answer session. I was very happy that Hannah Owens, Jorge Soberon, and Luis Osorio all joined me, and hopefully um, none of the three of them will figure out that um, that I am uh, making this video because, well, we had some technology problems, which is to say, um, first of all, the Hangouts YouTube link that I used to use is canceled. So I spent yesterday trying to figure out a new technology. I landed on this thing called Ecamm, which actually was pretty good, except that some secure sockets layer died uh, a few minutes before we were supposed to broadcast. At the end of the day, I figured, well, I'll just do a screen movie and post it, except that I forgot to turn on the recording of the screen movie. So, what a mess. Um, what it comes down to is I'm going to re-record this, uh, Jorge, Hannah, and Luis, please forgive me. Um, you guys do a better job of answering these questions than I do, but I figure it's better to get something out there instead of nothing. So, again, my apologies. Um, first of all, some ground rules and some some to repeat some things about the course. Um, every Monday morning at 9, we post the videos. We don't post them earlier because um, sometimes I get them up on the on the, the YouTube platform out of order and things like that. So it actually works better if they come, come to be available on Monday mornings. Um, between Monday and Wednesday, you uh, submit your questions. And we only got like 260 questions this time. So I was a bit surprised. Um, I hope that more people will submit their questions next week. Um, and probably beginning next week, we're going to start essentially taking attendance and see who uh, is submitting their questions because a bunch of you want a certificate of participation out of this. Um, the other thing is the questions that you all submit. Um, I know that you have a million questions, and I know that a lot of you have used these, these uh, methods before. So it's very easy to jump um, ahead and um, ask questions about, I don't know, model evaluation or climate change transfers or something like that. We really want you to submit questions about the material from this week. So if you can, kind of hold back from the questions that are down the road. Uh, we're going to pick out questions to answer each week, and I guarantee you we're going to pick out the questions that are about the material from that week. So um, do us that favor. Do yourselves that favor. Um, and definitely, definitely don't ask the question, how many points do I need to run a niche model? Because the answer was last year, this year, and will be next year. No answer, because very simply, um, it varies from species to species, and the only answer I can give you is more is better. Okay, so don't even ask that question. Already a bunch of people asked it this week. Okay, so let's look at some questions. I'm going to try to go over the ones that Jorge and Hannah and Luis answered. I won't get them exactly. Um, again, my apologies. Uh, very simply, I messed up. Okay, so let's look at this question from Aniket Prakash. Um, how can Hutchinson's duality be explained in simple words? Well, um, Hutchinson's duality is a very simple concept. Um, every species is found in a place or many places, and 
those places have environmental conditions. And very simply, um, both the environmental conditions have to be right for the species, and the geographic range has to be sufficient and accessible for the species. And so a species literally has to exist in these two spaces, geographic space and environmental space. And if it doesn't exist in either of those spaces, sorry, if, I, if it comes not to exist in even one of those spaces, it goes extinct. So a lot of what we'll talk about in the concept part of niche modeling is somewhere in between these two spaces, either geographic range, concepts like M, and distribution, or uh, environmental spaces, concepts like niche. Um, and, and biotic interactions really exist in both. Uh, you can have strong competition, which occurs in environmental space, that is at the same time um, manifested only part in part of the species range. Um, now, a very interesting point about uh, the Hutchinsonian duality is that the relationship between the two species is very interesting. Um, in the old days, when we had relatively simple environmental coverages, we had um, a relationship where single environmental conditions could refer to multiple geographic locations. But as we've gotten better and better and more and more detailed environmental conditions, now uh, there really is a one-to-one -one relationship between the two spaces which is to say every point in geographic space maps uniquely onto a single point in environmental space and vice versa. Now, if all of those, those mapping lines between the two spaces, if all of them lined up kind of in parallel, then your environmental map and your geographic map would be the same thing. In reality, those lines are not at all parallel, which is to say two points that are very close to one another in geographic space could be very different from one another in environmental space. And two points that are very similar to each other in environmental space can be far apart geographically. So it's that strange topology of the relationship between the two spaces that makes a huge difference. Uh, and we're going to talk about it a lot in, in niche modeling. Okay, next question. What is the difference between ecological niche modeling and species distribution modeling? That's an interesting question. Um, get back. You probably don't want to see my face, but it's better than looking at a, a table of questions. Um, we have these two terms, ecological niche modeling and species distribution modeling. Um, and many people in this field use the two terms interchangeably as if they had exactly the same meaning. And so you can read many, many, many papers that do what I would call niche modeling and call it distribution modeling, or do what I would call distribution modeling and call it niche modeling. Um, and you can also find papers that use both terms even in the same paragraph. I really feel like we could be more rigorous in our terminology. If the object of the model is to capture, to approximate, to estimate the ecological niche, then all we need is information about the environments where the species maintains populations. However, if we want to capture, estimate, approximate the geographic distribution of the species, then we actually have an additional step. Because we can use our environmental conditions and our points of known occurrence or points where there are populations. We can use that information to get information about tolerance limits, essentially the limits of the niche. But um, that will not tell us a whole lot about 
um, the geographic distribution. It tells us about the potential geographic distribution, yes. But going from potential to actual is actually pretty hard. Depending on how broadly you transfer your models, you're going to get many areas that are maybe suitable, but not accessible and therefore not inhabited. So these are terms that make a difference. And I would really urge each one of you to think about, is this a niche model or is this a distribution model? And do your very best to use the appropriate terminology and use the appropriate set of methods for that terminology. Let's look at a few more questions. Um, I have a few marked out here. What can we do when we don't have the complete distribution of a species? So this looks like it's from Fabricio. Um, that's an interesting question. I guess if we had the complete distribution of the species, we wouldn't really need a, a, a niche model, or at least not a distribution model. Um, but I think what you're asking is, what do we do when we don't have sampling from across the complete distribution of the species? Maybe it's a, a neotropical species, and I only have North American occurrences of it. Or maybe I've only got sampling from Poland and not from Belarus and, and Ukraine. Um, so what do we do? Well, geographic bias is not crippling, it's not terrible in niche modeling. It's environmental bias in the sampling that makes a difference. So for example, if for that species that's neotropical, um, if that means that um, I'm only seeing, let's say, the, the subtropical and temperate extreme of the distribution, then I'm never going to see its equatorial part of its distribution, which is aseasonal and all that. So um, we really have to think about not is there a geographic bias, but rather is there, is there an environmental bias. And so for example, you might have a mountain range that is well sampled. And going up that mountain range may tell us an enormous amount about temperature responses. Okay, it doesn't get at the seasonality dimension, but it at least gets the temperature responses. So what it really means is that we need to delimit our model calibration area carefully. And we're going to talk about that in a few weeks. We delimit that, that calibration area very carefully. And then we should ask questions about how representative is it of the environmental conditions where our species can maintain populations. And so essentially we're going to look at the distribution of our occurrences with respect to the environments available across that region that is both accessible to our species and has been sampled. We'll talk about that later. But we're going to look at those uh, occurrences and we're going to ask um, does the do the occurrences fall well within the limits of what is accessible and has been sampled or are there perhaps limits that are not well characterized by our niche model and of course you're right that's going to be more common when our sampling is limited with respect to the whole distribution of the species so that may limit our ability to uh, use and interpret our models in all circumstances. Let's see. Okay. Can two species, maybe strict mutualists, occupy exactly the same realized niche. We had two different kinds of answers to that. Um, Hannah Owens made a very interesting point. If we define the realized niche as we have in this course and as we will in this course, 
to include the effects of accessibility, the, the M constraint in the BAM diagram, and the effects of uh, biotic interactions, then our two species, maybe they interact very closely the way, um, the way our, our uh, student who's asking the question asks, but their two biotic components cannot be the same because their two biotic components refer to one another. So species A's biotic component will be defined by species B, and species B will be, its biotic component will be um, defined by, by species A. And so in that kind of definitional sense, no, they can't ever, ever, ever have the same realized niche. Now, I answered a different way, and I was, I was coming at it more from an empirical side, and basically my perception was, because I work with, with disease systems quite a bit, my perception was that whenever we see a tight one-to-one, -one, you know, this pathogen and this, and this host or something like that, whenever we see those associations, even when they're super tight, um, there are always exceptions. And I think probably a very interesting field to explore is the the idea of does um, does a sub niche exist for the mutualist? So let's say maybe we're talking about a hantavirus and a mouse species, and that one hantavirus is only found in that one mouse species. Well, the hantavirus isn't necessarily found in every population of that mouse species. And I would be very interested and am very interested in the question of whether there is any environmental bias of which of those populations are and which are not um, inhabited by that, that, that virus. Um, so I think that there are some interesting questions in there. Um, this, this was an interesting and challenging question, and it was neat that we got two such different uh, answers. So another question is from Jose Gonzalez from the Philippines, and he says he plans on incorporating ENM in his thesis, and his main interest is in R modeling, and could we provide an outline of the topics that in R or on R that we'll tackle through the course. So, Jose, you're in luck. We're going to do a lot of work with R, um, but I do want to kind of come back to your question. But first of all, um, I'm just going to go down through the course topics list, and you're going to see Plant R and Niche Toolbox. Uh, those are both taught in R. Um, you're going to see a module on estimating M, which is also a, on an R platform. You're going to see Maxent in R, Model R, Wallace, Biomod. Um, you're going to see a ton of tools that are in R. So, yeah, you're going to you're going to get what you're after, and I'm glad of that. Uh, I really want you to feel that this course was useful, uh, and at the same time. Um, I want to emphasize that R is a platform. It's almost like saying, you know, how about um, Microsoft Windows modeling? Well, you know, I've run a lot of models on Windows platforms, but they have nothing to do with Microsoft Windows. Um, R is the same thing. It can be used for dozens of different kinds of models. And um, so I think, you know, be clear that the question is not R modeling. The question is what kind of models we're going to use R to implement. Um, okay, so here's another interesting question uh, from Miguel Serrano, it appears, from Spain. Uh, after the example of Centaria in Town's talk, my talk, it is clear that we couldn't even approach to the fundamental niche which might include desert or, or uh, subtropical rainforest environmental conditions, 
if we had only used for modeling the native occurrences from Europe and West Asia. Is it still worth modeling the invasiveness of a species uh, using information only from its native range? And if yes, what cautions should be included in our analysis? So the interesting point is this difference between the existing niche and the fundamental. The existing is what we can characterize, and the fundamental is what we want to characterize. They're certainly related to one another, uh, but not directly and not, um, not simply. So um, we really have to take this concern um, to heart. So one answer is very simply that the native range may be sufficient, if its environmental range is enough that we can uh, characterize each of the limits of our species in each of the environmental dimensions. But if our, if our native range and, and the, part, the areas around it that our species have ex has explored, if it is limited in its environmental representativeness, then we do have a problem. Um, we may even have a problem if we, if we look at global invaders. There may still be limits to what kinds of combinations of uh, environments are represented anywhere on Earth. So what we need to do is we need to use a tool that tells us um, where on the region that we're interested in, where do we not have analogous environments in our calibration region. And so uh, Hannah Owens, one of the instructors and one of the persons who was on the first version of this um, question and answer session, Hannah was the lead author on a paper in 2013 that spoke about exactly these points. Um, I will put this paper and any others that we mention, I mention, in the course of this, um, this session. I'll put them on um, on the web for you all, and the, the link will show up. I'll show you where. Go to the course plan, and here where it says additional materials, uh, that's where you'll see those links. Um, anyhow, that paper presented a tool called MOP, and MOP is all about having a picture of when we're going to calibrate our model in one place and then um, transfer it to another place, um, we want to know where is that model going to have to be extrapolated, which is to say where are the conditions on the transfer region not represented in the calibration region. Um, so I encourage use of MOP anytime there's a model transfer. Now, another kind of answer to this question is, well, um, we, can, um, we can think about the native range as presenting some level of, of environmental uh, variety. If we have a species that is already invasive and established, maybe on other continents, we can use that information perfectly well. The models will be strongest if our species is in what we call distributional equilibrium, which is to say the models will be strong enough if we are using um, if we're using uh, populations that have kind of expanded out to their limits on a particular landscape. Um, but that's a good way of broadening the diversity of. Uh, of the environments in our um, in our calibration region, and by by that by those means, um, get a more representative model calibration area. So um, that's a good question. Here's another one: um, How do you represent, or how can you represent the existing niche? in geographic space. Well, um, in the geographic space um, where you calibrated your model, 
the existing niche is what you can see, which is to say it's the points. Those are, by assumption, within the existing niche. And then we can infer other environments that are similar to those points. And that is our estimate of the existing niche. And across the calibration region, our estimate of the existing niche will map directly onto some hypothesis of distribution. Now, where it gets complicated is when we want to transfer that, that niche model because the existing niche is not the fundamental niche. And so if we want to transfer that model to the whole world or to a future climate scenario to get an idea of the species' distributional potential, well, we have to be sure that we're not transferring an incomplete uh, picture of the species' niche. Let's see. Okay, there's an interesting question. Um, can species respond to environmental change by shifting their fundamental niche rather than being extirpated from a particular area? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. Evolution clearly happens if we believe in one origin of life on Earth, then clearly all of the variety of... Um, all of the variety of niches across all of life um, had to have come by, by changes in fundamental niches, uh, which is to say fundamental niches are an evolved characteristic of organisms. And so, yeah, species can um, see evolution in their fundamental niches. The question is, how fast does it happen? Um, which is to say, it does happen. Um, in vertebrates, um, with some, some work that Jorge Soberon and I have done over the years, um, and others from whom you'll hear, but we have a fair amount of evidence that... Um, for example, speciation takes place a lot faster than niche change does, which is to say we have a fair amount of evidence of niche conservatism. Um, and that means that if the environmental change is fast, like in our current uh, climate change um, situation, well then, um, the species can't respond fast enough. Okay, but certainly niche evolution is a possibility. And we're going to hear later on a talk from um, Alex Dinis Filio, who is going to talk, well, he's going to talk about frontiers and niche modeling, but I'm guessing he's going to talk about, at least in part, evolutionary rescue, which is exactly this question of how much of the negative consequences of climate change can be made up for by niche evolution. Let's see. A few more. For non-mobile species like plants that have historical occurrences outside of the fundamental niche or predicted potential suitable habitat, what could be the reason? Okay, so this is, this is kind of reading the tea leaves of, of the BAM diagram. Um, not an easy question. It may well be that those historical occurrences are informing about um, parts of the fundamental niche that we don't appreciate given current occurrences, which is to say the species may have been extirpated from parts of its fundamental niche, and so we now think that the niche is smaller. Um, also, the question, I mean, you say non-mobile species, but plants may well have um, dispersal mechanisms that sometimes 
take the species outside of appropriate conditions. So maybe that's not a great answer to your um, to your question, but but it's a matter of understanding the life history of the particular species in good detail. Let's see. I think I just saw one about. There we go. Um, in the model, in the example of a niche model for Tijuca atra. This is the, the bird that I pre presented on. The model assumes that the occurrence points outside of the modeled area are errors and that the accessible areas lacking occurrence points are just outside of the bird's niche. But couldn't that gap in occurrence points just be undersampling bias? Could those occurrence points that are left out of the model ellipse not be errors, but just be the few real occurrences recorded because of poor data collection? Very good point. Um, could be. Um, I actually believe in the power of citizen science, and birds are kind of the poster child of citizen science. A bird as rare as Tijuca atra is um, it's gold for bird watchers. Um, and so I suspect or believe that the bird watchers would have detected and reported those populations if they existed. Um, also, this is a species that's found only in forests, and a lot of those gaps um, also are places that without forest. Um, and some of the more reasonable over-prediction areas, the, there was one that I pointed to that was kind of at the southern edge of the range, uh, that's actually a place where birders go pretty frequently and haven't found this species. So um, I am pretty sure that those couple of reports there are errors. I'd be happy to be wrong because that would mean that the species um, is better off than we think it is. Okay. Um, is null hypothesis testing required, like the method by Reyes and Terstige, where they ran randomly selected occurrence points to the model 100 times, which created a null for testing if the model AUC is significant? We're going to talk about this um, to some degree more in, in the model evaluation portion of the, uh, of the course. Um, but it's an interesting question. There's a really neat paper by a, a man named Colin Beale. Um, I'll put it up on the, on the web for you all. Um, a frustrating paper awakened a huge amount of controversy. A bunch of us criticized the paper. But it was a neat idea, which is you can generate something that looks like a niche just by having clustered points in geographic space because environments are spatially autocorrelated. So clustered points will tend to identify some subset of environmental space which might look like a niche. And so what Beale did was to uh, create null species um, that have the same spatial characteristics as our species of interest, and then ask whether the species of interest has a more cohesive niche than the null species. That was really interesting. Um, I want you to read that paper. Again, I don't agree with it at all. And the conclusions to which Beale came to are wrong. Uh, but it's an interesting paper and it talks to or speaks to the idea of do we need or can we use null models in niche modeling? Um, Rays and Terstige, I believe, were using it more uh, in a model evaluation sense, uh, but I think there's a broader place that hasn't really been, been looked at enough in this field. Here's another practical question. Um, what programs do we need to get access to in order to the, complete this course? 
Well, I, I think that you can get a lot out of this course without any programs, um, but it's going to be all the conceptual stuff, um, and it's going to be all the all the the arguments um, and none of the implementation. Um, If you want to get more out of this course, then yeah, you, there's going to be a bunch of programs you need. Um, we're teaching this course essentially all with uh, open tools, free tools. Um, so I would say the two most important that you would need would be R, um, which is a statistical analysis platform, but increasingly it is the platform for analyses such as this one. And then I'd like you to have a GIS program. You can do a lot of GIS in R, but um, I think that it's smart to look at your um, outputs very frequently and be able to zoom and, and pan and play around and things like that. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I think those are your two um, most important things. R and the, the open GIS program that's easiest to use is QGIS. Um, we'll mention other programs during this course, but they're mostly kind of standalone programs. And we will do our very, very best not to uh, ask you to use anything that is a, um, a commercial software product. Another question, I'm just going to jump to number four on this list. Um, actually, I'll do number one as well. The question is about what is a non-interactive variable? Uh, this is another word for centipoetic variables or um, what some people call Grinnellian environmental variables. Um, but it's a, a refinement, and it's not exactly the same. So Grinnell listed a bunch of variables that were almost all non-interactive, centipoetic. Um, but he also included one or two that were interactive, biotic variables. Um, so nothing's perfect. Um, centipoetic was, was defined pretty clearly. Um, but we've all fallen into the, the laziness of saying biotic versus abiotic. But if you think of things like vegetation, that's a pretty biotic variable, and yet it doesn't change and it doesn't interact with a species' presence or absence, very quickly at least. And so from the standpoint of a present-day distribution, um, it really is a biotic variable that does not interact. But then we have biotic interact sorry, biotic variables that interact very tightly with the presence or absence of the species or with its numbers. Uh, we have biotic variables like, I don't know, uh, the numbers or the distribution of a competitor or a pathogen or uh, a host. And so we, which is to say Jorge um, Soberon and colleagues in a, in a book in 2011, um, we all uh, suggested this refinement to the concepts. It doesn't matter if they're biotic or, or abiotic or if they're on Grinnell's lists. Uh, and centipoetic is kind of an ugly word. So just for clarity, we started using the term interactive versus non-interactive. Non-interactive are generally abiotic, but they're characteristics of the environment that are not affected, that don't interact with the presence or absence or abundance of the species in question. Then number four was kind of interesting. Uh, the Gomez Pompa Soto Esparza model is simple but they never mention niche modeling or never even niche. Um, 
So we really wanted to give you those early antecedents. And I find it fascinating that in many senses we're using the same tools inferentially as we did, not we, I was, I was little, um, but as people did even 40, 50 years ago. Um, and so there were a lot of early efforts, uh, particularly in Australia and in Mexico, that were estimating some environmental envelope en route to um, finding the distributional potential of the species. Um, I'm not sure that we were the first, but certainly we, um, in 1999, in a paper that I'll put online for you all, um, Jorge and I and, and one other colleague um, we certainly made the point very emphatically that, oh, these are not distribution models. These are niche models. And we can see that because they overestimate the distribution. And they overestimate in such a way that they anticipate the distributions of closely related species. And so we kind of made that, that intellectual leap to starting to call it a niche or a niche model. Um, so that's why those early uh, models, those things that I, I laid out in, in my distribution ecology talk, that's why, I mean, they're, they're very much worth mentioning. But I think we get better at doing these, these models when we have a more rigorous and complete conceptual um, framework. So I, I think that's, a, that's an important thing to mention. Um, there's a lot of repetition um, of the questions, and that's, that's good because it means that we're killing multiple birds with, with one stone. Um, Okay, here, here's one. This is, in a way, getting a little bit out in front of ourselves, but, but maybe it's worth, worth talking about now. My question is related to the quality of occurrence data. Some species lacking high, quality, high enough quality data have non-georeferenced occurrences with a detailed description of the locality where the record comes from. Is it a good idea to assign coordinates to these localities based on locality descriptions to build ENMs? So the simple answer is yes. Um, it gets to a slightly more complicated question, um, which is to say um, the simple answer is, yeah, use all of the information you can get, and particularly when it's a species where you don't have much information. The more complicated part is, as you'll see in, in lectures to come, uh, the more complicated answer is that you also have to be very careful that the spatial resolution of your occurrence data matches the spatial resolution of your environmental data, and that you're essentially not over-interpreting either of those um, sets of information. So we're going to spend a lot of time on occurrence data and data quality and sources of, of occurrence data. And the only reason why I'm kind of allowing myself to jump ahead a couple of weeks and answer this question is that it's really important. So um, good question. Now, there are a lot of good questions, and a bunch of you have said, well, can I get an answer to my question? And I'm, I'm sorry. Um, we're an all-volunteer group, and the only person who is um, able to put in huge amounts of time to this course is me, and my students would, would object to even that. Um, everybody on this teaching team is a volunteer, and I just don't have enough person power um, to get all of the questions answered. So each week, we'll try to answer the questions that are most relevant or most common uh, so that we get you something, okay? 
uh, but my apologies. Again, please ask questions about the material presented that week, and also please don't ask the question about how many points do I need to run a niche model. Uh, I hope that this course is useful for you all. Uh, my colleagues and I are trying our best, uh, so please bear with us when we screw up like I did this morning, and um, check out the new uh, videos that will appear online on Monday. So have a good weekend, everybody.